So when, when I talk about cases that I've had uh, that have been quite formative for me, I, I cast my mind back a long, long time ago when I first joined the Air Wing, and uh, it's it's a really it's 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 a sad story. It's uh, it, it's in some respects it's a positive story, but essentially I'd only relatively just qualified to working on the ambulance helicopter. So in Victoria we have a, a crew mix of one paramedic, a pilot, and a crewman, and um, you know, coming to terms with not only the medicine that's involved in working on a HEMS was a big challenge, but obviously working in the aviation space was another big challenge. But I work in Gippsland, which is um, uh, sort of in the eastern part of Victoria, and it's relatively early one morning. It was an October morning. I remember being an October morning, and we were tasked to go down to a cyclist um, that had been hit by a car. Information was scant as it often is for us and you know we we were flying down there thinking that we were going to a relatively benign sort of cyclist who had a shoulder injury and um and had come off his bike after being hit by a car but you know again not a lot of information was coming from the scene Uh, we got overhead uh we offered to land at the scene and the crew there was some paramedics and attendants intensive care crew and uh, some ALS paramedics at the scene, and they said, "No, go to the football oval," and um, which was nearby. So we we relocated there. But there was a really significant delay in the, the ambulance turning up to the scene, and you know I hadn't really tried to uh, understand why the delay uh, existed. Um, I got on the radio and asked for sit rep, and didn't get much back. But it it really didn't occur to me that things were probably not going to plan in the back of the ambulance. Uh, we arrived at. Uh, the ambulance arrived at the, at the at the football oval, and we were presented by um, a person that I actually knew as a patient. So he, the, the man in the in the in the ambulance was a GP physician from a uh, place called a place called Foster, which is in the east of the state. Um, I speak about this particular story in my book, so I have got um, I have got permission to talk about it, and I've also got an interesting insight in the book that I got uh, Phil to write about his, his experiences as a patient from the other side. Uh, Phil was a wonderful human being. He was more than a GP in his community. He was loved and adored by his community. And, and after the accident, there was quite an outpouring of love towards him. But uh, Phil presented to the to the Oval and uh, I got into the ambulance. And, and, and straight away, I noticed that some of the paramedics were upset because they all knew Dr. Phil because uh, they had a close relationship with him. Um, I perhaps didn't appreciate the impact that that would have had on the paramedics at the time. But it's interesting, I got into the ambulance and um, the first thing that struck me as I opened the door of the ambulance was that I had this overwhelming smell of, of, of blood. Like, I, I, you know, mm-hmm. you talk about that dual processing model of how you process information that without hearing any feedback, I knew bleeding was a significant component of this particular case. Um, Again, in terms of some of the stimulations that I that I remember, sort of as I reviewed the case later, was that when I looked at the monitor, if you look at the Zoll monitor, every in terms of the alarming that was going off, that if you use a Zoll monitor, if something is out of parameter, it not only does the monitor alarm, but it flashes. And I remember just scanning the screen as I got into the ambulance and looking at every parameter, and it was flashing. So every parameter was mm-hmm. was outside of the normal range. And the first, again, the next thing that sort of struck me is that when I got into the ambulance, there was um, uh, four paramedics in the back of the ambulance, so a significant workforce. Uh, the patient was lying on the bed and he was, um, he, 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 again, without hearing any feedback, uh, he was in a, you know, quite an altered conscious state. He, was, he was, wasn't pale, he was transparent. Um, he was thrashing about, he was cerebrally irritated. And I felt that moment of being quite overwhelmed uh, with lots of priorities that with that, again, before I even heard the hand over, I, I was becoming increasingly concerned and increasingly alarmed. Um, in terms of the cognitive load, I, I, I felt it starting to build very, very quickly. Um, the first thing that really, that, that I remember when I recall this case is that when I looked at the paramedics, I looked towards um, there was three intensive care paramedics in the ambulance and I looked towards one of them for a handover and he, he, he just stared at me blankly. I looked at some of the others and they, they stared back to me and I, and I made the question, who's going to give the handover? And there was this disconnect, like they, the, the intensive care paramedics all looked at each other and 
you know, in reflection, the thing that became apparent was that no one was actually in control because there was some confusion, a bit of a communication breakdown is that the very junior paramedic who intensive care paramedic arrived on scene first, um, assumed that his his junior uh, tenure in the job meant that the more experienced intensive par paramedics who arrived a few minutes later that they would take over and the mm -hmm. experienced paramedics assumed that the new one. So there was a breakdown in communication in terms of who was running the case. And, you know, I, 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 I'm becoming increasingly alarmed. There's no real clear information. And then one of the paramedics starts stumbling through a, um, a handover, which he clearly wasn't prepared for. So he, he, he certainly was under a lot of pressure. And I kept looking back at the patient who's, you know, his observations are all deranged. He's now thrashing about. Um, and, I, and I immediately think that I need to get a really quick assessment done and start to get some treatments uh, action because there didn't seem to be a lot going on despite all the people in the back of the ambulance. So uh, I began my primary survey and uh, secondary survey and the patient was now becoming to the point where he was so distressed and so terribly irritated, I felt that our ability to provide even basic treatment was becoming impaired. As was at the time, um, our guideline was to give a bolus of ketamine, a small bolus of ketamine to the patient. And, you know, in terms of uh, my assessment, I was probably about halfway through. And that's a significant factor in terms of uh, where the errors come from in this case, mm -hmm. is that um, you know, I, I stopped at that point and asked what drugs they'd prepared. They, they had been talking about preparing for RSI. We had some ketamine ready. And so I asked for a small dose of ketamine to be given. And um, the patient had 40 milligrams of ketamine in a bolus to facilitate pre-oxygenation for the RSI. And there was this moment where the patient uh, relaxed immediately, but then he went into respiratory arrest. Yeah. And we had no recordable blood pressure. And that was a development that I, I really didn't expect. And it was really confronting to me. And I had that, that moment of absolute panic, like, what have we done? Have we given the right drug? Um, that's not something that I expected. Um, and, you know, you, you talk about managing cognitive burden. Uh, certainly for me, I, 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 there was a clear moment where I, I felt the need to get out and run away, like that fight, mm -hmm. fight, fight uh, response. And there was probably 30 seconds of just sheer and utter panic in my part. And, and people have said to me when I reviewed this case with the people at the scene, they said, well, you didn't look like you were panicking. But I certainly wasn't leading. And I wasn't yeah. leading the, the team. Uh, we didn't have a plan. And there was this period where I, in reflection, I, I, I certainly wasn't in control and I was very, very unhappy in my own performance in reflection. And it, But there, there came a point where I said, okay, this, this case is spiralling out of control. The patient is now pre-arrest. Um, and I said, right, let's just stop and go back and start the primary survey and, and, and perform the secondary survey again. And it, it's not until I did that that I went back and I performed that primary and secondary survey that the, the treatment priorities fall out of that. So, you know, in terms of how you work from that, you build your team based on that. I subscribe to the theory around exploiting the skill sets of the people at the team so to, to really try and exploit your team. So make sure that your intensive care paramedics uh, are doing intensive care things. Make sure that your advanced life support paramedics are working within their skill set so that we don't have this misuse of skills so um, we did the I did the primary and secondary survey and from that I was able to do the tasking from that um, the interesting thing was that um, the patient had been put in a vacuum mattress um, because um, the patient was cold and was laying on the road and it was, it was a cold October morning and there was a belief within the team that a pelvic binder had been fitted. Now, they diagnosed a, a fractured pelvis, which the patient had an open book fractured pelvis. But there was that disconnect in the communication at the start of who was owning the job. Um, someone discussed putting a SAM splint on, assumed it had been put on, hadn't been put on. It wasn't until we went back and had that moment where we stopped and went back and did the DRABC and then did the primary secondary survey that we, did, we worked out that that splint hadn't been put on. And the patient had torn his rectum, which basically opened up our pathway in terms of that open book fractured pelvis was now an open open fracture and was bleeding. And, and when we pulled the vacuum mattress apart, we found that the patient was almost submerged in his own blood. Yeah. Wow. Um, so we obviously quickly put the, 
put the, uh, the the sand splint on and began our resuscitation phase. But for me, the, the really significant part of this case is, you know, from that point on, uh, we got in control, we built our team, uh, we began our treatment priorities, and we and and it was it was methodical, it was consistent. We followed our processes and it was in control. If the patient had arrested during that time, and I and um, when we eventually got ready to perform the RSI for the second time, um, you know, we had blood running, we began the resuscitation phase and the patient did brady down into, the, his heart rate went down into 30. So he's absolute pre-arrest um, yeah. from hypovolemia. But the, the interesting thing for me in terms of during that time is that we were now in control of the job. Um, I was now leading the job. I was now leading the team. People were being efficient in their, their care and their practices. Um, but when I went away afterwards and, you know, reviewed the case in, in its entirety, I, I was really disappointed with my performance in that, that time where I wasn't in control. Um, there was unquestionably, whether the people on the outside didn't see it, but internally there was panics, the duck on the pond theory, mm -hmm. that I was, I was really struggling. And, you know, I, I've, I've been very, very fortunate to work in the aviation space um, I'm fascinated by human fa uh, factors. I'm fascinated by human behaviour. So I've started really looking closely at our pilots and talk to them about how they manage cognitive load and the co cognitive load theory. Um, I, I spoke to them about, you know, where, where does error come from? And then I really spent a bit of time trying to understand the recent error model um, and looked at the, the, you know, the latent failures and the active failures in, and how we do things. And when I reflect on, on that particular case, in terms of the 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 reason error model and and despite the barriers that we build into our practice all the barriers that we do in terms of what we do all have holes in and failure points in them so many of those uh, holes lined up on that particular case that if we you know uh if we hadn't have acted as quickly as we did um if we hadn't have um uh taken the actions we did i'm sure that dr phil would have not survived the particular incident because his injuries were so horrific. But it really was a sentinel case for me in terms of my learning. I, I really started to invest in to try and understand uh, the human factors and, and understand how we as paramedics can exploit the tools that we have before us and how we manage those human factors. And, you know, it, it's funny. Um, I sit down now and I, I talk to people about understanding their disaster personality. So, you know, in terms of when people have that building cognitive load and as, as, as the information continues to pour in or the gravity of the information is becomes more and more intense, um, we increase our cognitive burden. Associated with that increasing cognitive burden is our risk and uh, the, the pathways for error. And, you know, something that a lot of people in the world would never experience is a, is a, is a phenomenon called the amygdala hijack. So that's that that absolute cognitive overload. And it's a, a phenomenon that's seen in uh, aviation. So pilots, mm -hmm. when they have that, you know, 90, being a pilot's 99.9% .9 sheer and utter boredom with 0.1% sheer and utter terror. Yeah. But one of the things that when you go back to the 70s, you know, when jet travel became affordable, um, there was quite an explosion in the amount of uh, people that were now flying around the world, but there was also a, a huge association with lots more accidents, a lot more people dying associated with aviation accidents. And it wasn't until there was a, a NASA scientist back in the 70s started examining the, the black box data. He started speaking to survivors of, of plane accidents. And one thing that became really apparent to, to him was that there's some things that really have some really strong influence on cognitive load. Uh, unhealthy authority gradients is, is certainly one that he looked at. But a couple of really sentinel points that he made was that when when people that are in a leadership roles, be it a medical context or an aviation context, when they become un overloaded, they can't function. They can't take the steps to fix the problem. So they introduced the concept of load shedding, mm -hmm. uh, whereby that we look to give up some of the tasks, reduce our cognitive load. And that's what we do in an ambulance context. We look to load shed. So as a team leader, I'm looking to give you jobs as an intensive care paramedic. We're trying to exploit the skill sets, as I spoke to before. We're trying to make sure that people 
uh, stay within their skill set extension. So the intensive care paramedics are working in that. But all I'm trying to do by that is to try and take the pressure off me mm -hmm. so that I can be an, an effective, high-functioning leader um, and make sure that we exploit the skill sets of our team. Too often in ambulance do I see large teams of paramedics standing around uh, with one or two people working their backside up and a team of eight or nine people standing there doing nothing. So it's about yeah. exploiting those things. Um, so, you know, that, that was one of the findings that they found in terms of the aviation space back in the 70s that the pilots quickly became overwhelmed and that mm -hmm. they needed to have this concept of load shedding to give tasks off. Um, they also, also spoke about those authority grants that were really unhealthy. And we, as paramedics, we see this in medicine all the time, is that, you know, uh, you have scenarios where people the, in the leadership role have such an unhealthy gra authority gradient that no one can question them, no one can speak up and ask a question. And mm. um, if people are interested in that space, um, uh, Martin Bromley's uh, video on just, uh, just I think it's called Just a Routine Operation, where uh, Martin's an airline pilot and his wife goes in to have a knee reconstruction. Unfortunately, the anaesthetist... Um, uh, becomes quickly overwhelmed when he can't intubate his wife. He mm. suffers from uh, task focus. He loses his situational awareness. Um, there's a dozen people in that room, but because they've got such an unhealthy authority gradient that no one in that room can speak up and say anything, um, yeah. despite the fact that they know that um, Martin's wife's about to die, and she, and she in fact does. Yeah. So, um, again, that unhealthy authority gradient contributes to, to those bad outcomes. So... In terms of you know preserving cognitive uh, space and cognitive load theory, there's some of the positives that I take away, and I bring that back into ambulance. And it's important for us that we we buy into theories such as that crew resource model, whereas everyone at the scene feels that they should be able to contribute um, in terms mm -hmm. of patient safety. They should be able to speak up. So you should have an authority gradient that is uh, safe for people to express a point of view or a concern. Um, that as a leader, that you should never try, be trying to fix everything yourself. You should be empowering your team and building your team um, to, to be uh, to exploit those skill sets and exploit the level of care. So they're the things that really interest me. That case was sentinel in forming my um, desire to become a better paramedic mm. uh, and then share that experience to other people about how they can incorporate cognitive load theory to be to be better at what we do.